Good morning, friends. Hey, happy summer. First Sunday of uh, summer. For some of you, this is your very favorite season. For some of you, it's your second favorite season. Probably for all of us. I'm guessing it's in our top four. Uh, today, after today, we're going to be taking a break from the letter to the Hebrews, and we're going to, for the month of July, be in a series called Summer in the Psalms, and I know that it's actually just July in the Psalms, but it didn't sound as good, so it's not July in the Psalms, Summer in the Psalms, but five weeks in the Psalms that we will be uh, starting next week, and uh, here's a little bit of information for you, five Psalms, five different preachers in those five weeks. So that'll be interesting. You got a little bit of variety. I'll kick it off next week with um, Psalm 23. It's a pretty popular psalm, pretty familiar psalm, but that should be good. And I, I think this series, um, we'll get back into Hebrews after July, but but this, this little window here that we have, I think it's a great opportunity with a new series and it being in the Psalms. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for you, you maybe to think about who you could invite uh, to join you, and you could introduce them to City Point Church, help them to get familiar with the Lord, and um, maybe if they're not followers of Jesus, they could be they could become followers of Jesus. You see, so take advantage of that and uh, bring somebody with you. All right, but remember nine and ten thirty, and uh, that starts just this next Sunday. So uh, let's get started here at, as we get to the tail end of Hebrews chapter ten. Curse words aside. Let's use that as kind of just kind of the, the, the primary filter. Curse words aside, are there words that you're not supposed to say in your house? So in our house, especially when our kids were young, we, would, we wouldn't say stupid. Is that a thing in your house? So somebody would say something was stupid and then somebody else would say, we don't say stupid. And then uh, we weren't also, we weren't supposed to say, um, what, what is it? <laughs> I'm forgetting my own words here. Oh, shut up. We don't say shut up. Yeah, so somebody would say shut up, and then somebody else would say we don't say shut up. Okay, so we kind of got that. But one, one of the words that I tried to personally kind of drill into our kids was the word can't. Like, we don't say can't. Try to tell our kids, listen, there are things in life that seem hard, but don't say can't, as in you can't do them. There are things in life that are actually hard. They don't just seem hard, but they are hard. But you don't approach it by saying, I can't do it. Um, There are actually things that we've tried to do, and in our initial attempt, we weren't successful. But we still don't say can't. We tried to cultivate um, a certain mindset, a can-do attitude, right? Probably we've all heard of that, where we we want to muster up some courage and some optimism, and we want to look into life and say, I can do that. I'm going to try that. I've got got what it takes to do that, rather than a defeated, tail-tucked, I can't attitude. So we want to cultivate a can-do attitude. Now, The passage of Scripture that we're going to deal with today, um, it requires a can-do attitude. So before I used the terms courage and optimism, and those are great words for a can-do attitude, but we'll use these two words instead because they're words that come right out of our text, the word faith and the word endurance. So so a can-do attitude is an attitude where, where we, we have faith and we have endurance that as we go into facing obstacles and hardships and different things like that in life, that we, we don't say can't. We say we, we can do this with faith and with endurance. Now let me define these two words. They're, they're, they're simple words. They're Bible words, right? Faith, as we're using it, as our text would use it, is is not just this general belief or trust, but it's a faith in or a trust in and a reliance upon Jesus. And endurance is the inner fortitude. It's It's something that takes place in our souls. It's an inner fortitude that withstands 
is able then to withstand hardships and stress or suffering, fill in the blank with those difficult words. And what we recognize is this, that these two words are not really separable. It is actually a trust in Jesus and a reliance upon Jesus that develops endurance in us. It is as we trust Jesus and grow in that trust in him that we then can, then we have that inner fortitude to face suffering, hardship, stress, etc. Right? We can do these things. Now, the author's wrapping up this section of the letter. This is kind of a big turning point and an, 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 an ending point in, in the letter. And the next thing he does, as some of you are familiar, is he, he goes into this grand explanation of what living like faith looks like. And he uses all of these characters from the Old Testament in what we call the heroes of the faith chapter in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11. So we're going to get back to Hebrews chapter 11 after our summer in the Psalms series. But before he does that, as he's wrapping this section up, he gives his audience, which includes us, a warning and a reminder. And we need to look at the warning and the reminder today. Now, what I, what I need to tell you, friends, is this. The warning is not a hypothetical scenario. It's a, it's a real warning. It's a warning that is not without teeth. And if you've been with us during this whole series, you recognize that there are, there are strategically placed throughout this letter, the author writes these warning passages. And this is the fourth of five warning passages. And again, it's not hypothetical. It's a real warning. He's warning his audience about something so that they can avoid it. Okay? The warning is that apostasy is possible. Apostasy is possible. I'll define that term in just a moment, but let's get acclimated. Let's read these first several verses, starting in verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So what we have to talk about today is serious business, friends. This is, this is weighty content here, but we have to deal with it. This warning is that apostasy is possible. Now, my main caution today my prerogative is to exposit the text, to expose us to the text. What does this mean? But my caution, my, my main caution today is to be careful to not cause any undue insecurity among those who are truly following Jesus. This is not included in this passage of Scripture to make Christians insecure about their salvation. That's not why it's here. But the warning's real. The subject here is not just any, any sin. Not to make light of any sin, but this is not just any sin. It's the deliberate sin. That's the operative term in the passage. It's the deliberate sin of what we call apostasy. Apostasy, by definition, is to turn away from Jesus after having believed in him. Now, there are some who contend that that's not even possible. And my contention would be that these warning passages mean nothing if it's not possible throughout the entire letter. But again, we've got to be careful with it. Apostasy is to turn away from Jesus after having believed in him, and the operative term is deliberate. So it can be by deliberate choice to renounce one's faith. Many of us are familiar with celebrity-style Christians who have at one, some point along the line, they've, they've written books and they've become popular, and then for some whatever reason, they've renounced their faith. Are they apostates? I don't know. I'm not their judge. I'm hoping that they don't remain in that 
let's call it at least a state of rebellion. I don't know. God knows, right? But at some point, a deliberate choice to renounce one's faith would make one an apostate. A deliberate forsaking of him by prolonged indifference could also. Back in Hebrews chapter 6, one of the really difficult passages with regard to these warnings, I, I w worked through the, those first 12 verses of Hebrews chapter 6 in a message called Growing Confident. And if you want more on this, I would really encourage you to uh, go back and listen to that either through the YouTube channel or through our website. But it, it might be helpful to restate just a little bit of that uh, that we dealt with from chapter 6. In that, in that passage, similar to this one, it's dealing with apostasy. I said this, it's, this is not about faults. You and I have faults. We, we will always have faults until Jesus comes back. Hopefully we're growing, hopefully we're maturing and we're getting better, but until Jesus comes back and we experience the state of glorification, we're still in the process of being sanctified. So this is not about faults, friends. So dear Christian, please understand, you will have faults until Jesus makes you perfect. This is not about that at all. This is not about our shortcomings. James says we all stumble in many ways. This is not about us making poor decisions here and there in life and being like, ah, what am I doing? Jesus, please forgive me, right? This is not about that. This isn't even, as I said, about sin in general. Oh, to be sinless. But what we have to understand is we're forgiven. Jesus' blood was shed for our sins. Not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. So when we're talking about apostasy, it's not about faults and sins and shortcomings. All of that can be forgiven. This is not even, as I said in that message in, when we were talking about chapter 6, this is not even about t a, a temporal state of rebellion, which I said at that point is not recommended. Like none of us should test the waters and go, well, I'm going to just gonna rebel against God for a time, and then at some point maybe I'll come back. That's not a good plan. Like stick with Jesus. This is about a willful forsaking of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Apostasy is possible. So let's start working through the verses. The first thing that we have to recognize in this is that the warning is issued to followers of Jesus. That's the letter is written to Christians. He's not got multiple sets of audience that he, without any warning whatsoever, starts to address one audience in one section and then half a verse later addresses another audience without us even knowing that he's made the change. It's a single audience that he's writing to. The warning is issued to followers of Jesus. In this passage alone, we have two definitive bits of evidence in that regard. In verse 26, they had received the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth here is a way of saying that they had come to know the truth about God's salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ, in, in, in an experiential way. The Greek word that is used to, to receive is lambano, and it has the essence of experience. It means to take hold of something and be in possession of it. So you and I experience this sort of receiving in the giving and receiving of gifts. When somebody gives us a gift, they give us the gift. When, when we receive it, it is now in our possession. We now are holding it. That's what these people, this audience, had experienced with regard to following Jesus. They had received. They were in possession of the knowledge of the truth. The second bit of information here comes from verse 29 where we're told that they, past tense, had been sanctified by Jesus' blood. Right? They had been. That's a major theme throughout the entire letter. The shed blood of Jesus Christ covers sin and sanctifies. It sets the person, the believer, apart from sin and from the world and draws them, brings them near to God so that there's nothing between them and God. They're, they're cleansed and forgiven and made holy. They had experienced this. The letter is written to followers of Jesus, and the warning is 
to followers. Again, not to cause any sort of insecurity, but we have to get that. It's difficult. You have to do a lot of mental and theological gymnastics to take these warning passages in another way. You have to actually have this pre-described template that you set over the top of it to make it mean other things. It's really difficult to do, friends, but a, but a, a general reading of the passage is in order. Now, here's the other thing I want us to see, that the audience wasn't guilty of this, but some were in danger. Some were trailing down the wrong path. But they weren't guilty of this. A careful reading of this passage reveals that the intended audience hadn't done this. They had not yet become apostate. The author is warning them that it's possible. And the warning is included, includes the fact that some of them are actually a bit in danger. When the author states in the opening line, if we go on sinning deliberately, it correlates to what he had just written what we studied last week, those who had developed the habit of neglecting the gathered church. Those are not separate ideas, dear friends. It's a single line, right? Those who had developed the habit of neglecting the gathered church, he's saying that that's sin to do that. That can eventually lead to a total detachment from the body of Christ if it were carried out to its full length. And those who claim Jesus but then who forsake the church are deliberately sinning. They're in danger of desertion, not just of the church but of Jesus. Now, again, I want to be careful, really careful in this regard. This is not about somebody missing the gathering of the church because they're ill or because they're on vacation or something like that. It's not what this is at all. But there are some who say, Really dumb things like, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. That's, that makes no sense whatsoever. You, you can't reconcile that mindset at all with the Bible. The church is the body of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. So he's saying, again, it's not about missing because you're ill or on vacation or something like that. This is about a willful neglect of the gathered church. It's just me and Jesus and we do our thing. That's not New Testament Christianity at all. The church is essential. So this audience isn't guilty of it. But he's saying some of you have developed a habit that will lead to something that's not good. So correct it. Correct your habit. Break the habit. You don't want it to lead to desertion. The next thing that the author deals with here is he reiterates that Jesus is the only way. After having received the knowledge of the truth, verse 26 says, There's no long, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. If we go on sinning deliberately... If they turn away from Jesus, there's no other means by which we can be forgiven and reconciled to God. Remember, Jesus' sacrifice was that once for all, all time, all sin, all people. And if we turn from Jesus, there's nowhere else to go for forgiveness. The only thing he says to look forward to is a fearful expectation of judgment. It's really heavy, isn't it? Jesus is the only way, friends. He is God's solution to our problem. And there's no other solution offered. We need Jesus. So not turning turning from Him would be a, a, a fatal error. The next thing that we see here as we get into verses 28 through 31 is that for those who commit apostasy, and again, that's not, they're not going to do it against their own will. They're not going to do it accidentally. It's a willful decision. But for those who do, their damnation is deserved. And again, my goodness, that anybody who, who could say that with a, even a hint of pleasure in their voice is um, at least not paying attention to what they're saying. Right? But that's what the text says. The author makes this comparison between the consequences 
of abandoning the Mosaic Covenant and that of abandoning the New Testament or the New Covenant. He uses the word set aside. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. That was, that was the law. If you set aside or you abandon the covenant as an Israelite, in a court of law, two or three witnesses would testify to that. And if that was true, it was corporal punishment. It was a, a capital punishment. Right? And the author brings that up because his rationale, which is seen in this phrase, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved? Think about what he's writing here. He's asking his audience to consider. In making this comparison, he's saying the escalation of severity should be understandable. To forsake the law of Moses meant physical death. To forsake Jesus means eternal death, and that should be understandable is what he's saying. Look at the language. If we go on sinning deliberately, first he says that's tantamount. It's equal to trampling underfoot the Son of God. After learning what we've learned in the letter to the Hebrews, let alone everything else we know about Jesus in the whole of the Bible, that this is the one by whom and through whom all things came into existence. This is the one who voluntarily came from heaven and took on the form of a man and gave his entire life to the shedding of his blood, that he would die on a cross and be put in a tomb and then be raised from the dead, ascend to the right hand of the Father and intercede for us to this very moment. While the Father is forming His enemies into a footstool for His feet, this Jesus, some mere human being with all of their intellectual prowess, is going to try to trample Him underfoot? Not a good plan. He goes on. He says, that's like trampling the Son of God underfoot. It's like profaning the blood of the covenant. To profane. This is where we get our word profanity, right? It's something that's dirty. This, this blood that was shed, this pure blood that was shed because of love that is so immense we can't even fathom it. This blood that was shed for the sins of the world, to profane it would be like to spit at it. Like who cares? It's no wonder the third description is that it is to outrage the spirit of grace. I don't know what you feel like when you're outraged, but we pretty much know, right? This is not a term we typically think of with regard to the Holy Spirit, that he gets outraged. When you hear about the Holy Spirit, we think about how he convinces us that we need Jesus, how he convicts us of sin so we can repent and be right with God. We think about the Spirit, how he leads us and counsels us and comforts us, but the Spirit of God gets outraged. When somebody tries to trample underfoot the Son of God and profane His blood, the Spirit is outraged. And the question is, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved? This is a grotesque description of somebody holding Jesus in complete disdain and setting aside the covenant. Again, we look at true believers and we go, oh, Lord, never. Never, right? Never. We trust in and rely upon Jesus. We love Him. Right? But for those who commit apostasy, their damnation is deserved. The Lord, as the judge of such things, will pay back those who so treat Him. And this payback is described in strong terms, punishment, judgment, vengeance, a fury of fire. This is serious, serious stuff. We're told that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, let's keep it in context. It's not, for those who are true followers of Jesus, it's not a fearful thing. It's not a fearful thing at all. We reverence God. We have a fear of the Lord, which is to deeply reverence or respect God. But it is not a fearful thing for a true believer to fall into the hands of the living God. He's our Father. It's a fearful thing for those who commit apostasy for a person who has done this to fall into the hands of the living God, no question, but for a true believer, oh, friends, we enter into the presence of God, as last week's text tells us, with confidence, with gratitude, and with humility, and with joy. We can only imagine 
that day when Jesus ushers us into the presence of our Father and we recognize in a greater sense than we've ever experienced in our whole lives how good God is, how merciful and kind and patient and loving He has been to us for our whole lives. For true believers to be, to fall into the hands of the living God is, is what we're looking forward to, but not for the apostate. The apostate has made a dangerous enemy, and it's terrifying. This passage makes clear that apostasy is possible, friends, and we're told to completely steer away from it. We're encouraged, as we'll see, to look ahead because we have a lot to look forward to, and that keeps us. It keeps us away from that in any way. And that gets us to the reminder, friends, we have a lot to look forward to. What we'll see is what's stated in verse 34 is, again, more evidence that it's writing to believers as they have been enlightened. It's also evidence that the author didn't believe that they had committed this. They were not guilty of apostasy because they had endured up to this point. This here is a call for them to remember what they had endured when they first began to walk with Jesus. Let's read the verses. Verse 32, but he says, Recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly, publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Man. It's a description, right, of what they had endured when they first started walking with Jesus, described here as a hard struggle with sufferings. I wonder, do we know anything about that? Can we relate to this? Public insult, societal oppression, the imprisonment of loved ones, our property, our personal property being confiscated because we're followers of Jesus? Most likely, we can't relate to that. I mean, not really to, to a grand degree, maybe a bit of insult, maybe a bit of societal oppression, but we really can't relate to the hardship that they were going through, the hard struggle and the sufferings. That isn't to make light of our own sufferings. We have real sufferings. We have real hardships that we go through, but this sort of thing helps put that in perspective just a little bit. The reality is, friends, that suffering is part of following Jesus. And I know that there's a version of Christianity, it's a tainted, twisted version of Christianity that where struggles and hardships and suffering don't fit. And those who hold that sort of theology often try to find excuses and make other reasons for those things as to why hardships exist but what actually happens is when they experience the suffering and the hardship or whatever, it often upends them because they can't make any sense out of it. But for the true follower of Jesus who's sticking with the Scriptures, we recognize that reality, in the reality, suffering is part of following Jesus. We hear this first straight from the mouth of Jesus, then from the apostles, and then we can trace it throughout the entire history of the church. Look at these verses, John 15. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they, also, they will also persecute you. Kind of hard to interpret that any other way than suffering is part of following Jesus, right? He said, in this world, you will have tribulation. You will. Not you might. It may happen to you. No, you will. We will have this. It's part of following Jesus. The Apostle Paul said, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. He wrote to Timothy and said, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Persecute, tri persecution, tribulation, it's part of, of following Him. But we don't relish that. None of us knows, hey, sign me up. This is fun. Nobody does that. But we have to know it's part of the deal. And it always has been. 
And if we don't recognize that or we believe that pseudo-gospel that is so often proclaimed, it can really wreak havoc in our walk. Would we think, well, God's not faithful to me. God must not love me. I must be living in some sort of sin where I'm being punished. That's not the conclusion that we're supposed to draw. Suffering is part of following Jesus. For believers, for these believers, a hard struggle had become a way of life for them. Being publicly insulted, being oppressed by their society, their loved ones being imprisoned, their personal property being confiscated. For us, if we experienced any of that sort of thing, what would we do? We'd fight for our rights. And we would be right to do so because we actually have rights in this country. So we would fight for those rights. But for them, they didn't have any rights like that. They were victims without any sort of legal recourse. And they, verse 32, endured And they did so, verse 34, joyfully. What? Like, can we we imagine? God would have to give us some grace in that time, wouldn't he? Because it makes no sense. If we're not suffering right now, and we were to start experiencing things like this, like just imagining it, we go, whoa, I I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could do that. Let me tell you this, friends. Yes, you could. Yes, you could. Because God would help you. If you ever experiencing, if you ever experience anything like that, you will get grace from God. Right now, you're not experiencing it, so you think, I don't know, I don't know if I could be faithful to Jesus if I was going through something like that. Well, you you would. Because he would help you. Love God, follow Jesus, and you're going to be okay. You've got a lot to look forward to. Let's keep going here. They were able to do what they were doing, right? To suffer well, to suffer even joyfully, knowing that suffering is a part of following Jesus because they knew something, because they knew that they had a great reward. And though suffering is a part of following Jesus, a great reward is a bigger part of following Jesus. Look at verse 34 again. So they go through all of these things, And they do so joyfully since, he says, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has, there it is, a great reward. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. But if there's a verse to memorize, it'd be verse 36. It's a true statement, isn't it? Directly, like it's a true statement for me, it's a true statement probably for you, I would guess. I know Brent has need of endurance so that when I've done the will of God, I will receive what is promised. Endurance is part of the work that God is doing in our lives as we trust in and rely upon Jesus. He develops in us that inner fortitude so that we can withstand those things that are hard. But the, the reason they were able to do that is because they knew something. Back to verse 34, they knew something. They went through those things joyfully because they knew something. They knew. They had been enabled to endure a hard struggle with suffering. They had been enabled because they knew they had a great reward that they were looking forward to. One verse says that it's a better possession. This great reward is a better possession than the best that this life has to offer. And so... They didn't cling to their earthly possessions and they didn't lose their minds or their faith when their earthly possessions were taken from them forcibly. It was a better possession that they had, that they were looking forward to, that they had as a great reward. And it was, another line says that it's an abiding one. While everything here is temporal and we enjoy certain things to a certain degree for a relatively short period of time, The possessions that they were looking forward to, think about this, they've now been enjoying for 2,000 years, and it hasn't gotten old yet. It's an abiding possession. It's a lasting reward. They have received that. They are no longer looking forward to it. They no longer have hope in that regard because they've already received it, because they endured faithfully. 
For us, though, then we look at this and we go, okay, suffering is a part of following Jesus. Undeniable truth if you just read the Bible, but if you just read the Bible, it's not the greatest part of what it means to follow Jesus. It's the part that you just go like, endures the right word. But a great reward is a bigger part of following Jesus. And that's what we have to look forward to. Looking ahead will keep you following Jesus. Let's read our last couple of verses. For yet a little while and the coming one, that's Jesus, will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But, verse 19, final verse, uh, verse 39, sorry, final verse. But we are not of those who shrink back. Can you say amen to that? We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Can you say amen to that? We are of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Looking ahead is what keeps us following Jesus. Here's our big idea this morning. Knowing what's ahead of us empowers us to endure what's in front of us. Knowing what's ahead of us empowers us to endure what's in front of us. Often, friends, what's in front of us, that's that those things that we wish weren't in front of us. That's the hard struggle. That's the suffering, the the difficulty. And when we focus on them, when we keep our eyes fixed on them, they get really big. In fact, they get so big that we can't see past them. They just, they, they seem insurmountable. And for these believers, because they developed that can-do attitude. They had not just courage and optimism, but they had faith and endurance. It kept their present struggles that were right in front of them, it kept them in the proper perspective. They remained in the proper size that they were because they were looking ahead. They were looking ahead. They were looking forward. And what was ahead of them, that great reward, that better possession, that abiding possession, what was ahead of them is what empowered them to endure what was in front of them. That's our text this morning. What we have to look forward to in the future helps us endure what we're going through in the present. What's ahead of us, dear friends, is beyond our imagination, but we do well to challenge our imagination with it. What's ahead of us is glory and beauty and perfection beyond anything we've ever experienced. Ours is a future that is full of God and is absent of all of the bad stuff. Ours is a future that's full of life and creativity and enjoyment, and peace, and goodness, and love, and unity, and laughter, and camaraderie like we've never experienced before. And it's free of guilt and sin, and it's free of the devil, and death, and grief, and shame, and tears. And we don't have to ever deal with envy, or lust, or stress, or anger. And there's no more goodbyes. What's ahead of us, friends, is glorious. And when we look forward, it keeps us following Jesus because what's ahead of us empowers us to endure what's in front of us. There's a great reward that has been promised to followers of Jesus. And I'm afraid we think far too little of what's ahead of us and we think maybe too much about what's in front of us. It's hard not to concentrate on what's in front of us but we do well to look past what's in front of us to what's ahead of us. It will be realized, we're told, when Jesus returns in just a little while. Oh, what? Like God's little while sure seems different than our little while, right? I could say in just a little while, you're going to be enjoying ice cream in the the lobby. When God says a little while, it's a, a different type of little while, I guess. So we live by faith. We trust in and rely upon Jesus and we endure 
never turning back, never turning back. And in so doing, we're told we preserve our souls. To wrap this up, I want to go back to one line in verse 36. It's that verse I said, boy, there's one to memorize. It's the line that says, so that when you have done the will of God, you see that? So that when you have done the will of God. You know what that tells me? It tells me we can do the will of God. We can. You can do the will of God. And I suppose we could define the will of God here as faithfully following Jesus. In the midst of all of life's ups and downs, you can faithfully follow Jesus because he's your keeper. He's your Savior. I'm looking forward to next week, Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd. You and I can do the will of God. Even though, even though we don't say can't, there actually are a lot of things in life that we can't do. Fair enough, right? We can't do everything, that's for sure. We only have limited time, limited resources, limited energy. We can't do anything we set our minds to. I know we tell people that so that they aspire to great things, but literally you can't do anything you set your mind to. You and I have limitations but we can do the will of God. We can. We can follow Jesus for our whole lives. And knowing what's ahead of us helps us with what's in front of us. It empowers us to endure what's in front of us. So let's talk about ways to respond. By way of a few questions, first is what's ahead of you? What is ahead of you? If you're a follower of Jesus, what's ahead of you is wonderful. It's glorious. So keep your focus on what's ahead of you. If you're not a follower of Jesus, what's ahead of you is judgment. I take no pleasure in saying that. But I have to. A particular obligation. It doesn't have to be that. You can change that. God loves you. And he's given his son to die a sacrificial death for the punishment due your sins. And God will forgive you if you will trust Jesus and he will welcome you into his eternal family. So that what's ahead of you is eternal life and not judgment. And that decision can be made today by you. You can say, I, I put my trust in Jesus today. I want to be welcomed into God's family. I need God's forgiveness. And if that's a decision that you're making today, then let's talk about it. Let's pray, for, let's pray about it. One of our elders, one of our pastors, anybody with a lanyard, at the very least, make note of it on your connection card. Put your trust in Jesus today. Here's another question. Is there anything in the warning that brings conviction to you? The warning passage is, is serious, right? And I wonder, is there anything as I was working through that, those verses that brought conviction to you? And here's my question. What, what are you going to do about that? What how, maybe better was, what, what do you think Jesus wants you to do about it? And make a prayerful commitment to him. He wouldn't point that out to simply make you feel bad. He would point that out to draw you closer to himself. another thought. One of the best ways to keep our faith fresh is when we share it with others. So as I said before, maybe this coming week you could be prayerful about who, who is it that I could invite to be a part of the Summer in the Psalms series? 
and look for opportunity. Maybe, maybe make an opportunity to extend the invitation. And just be committed to that throughout this week to say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be purposeful about that. Give people a wonderful picture of who Jesus is for them from Psalm 23. Last thought is this. Are you in need of endurance? Maybe you're going through a hard struggle. And you're looking, you've been looking more at what's in front of you instead of what's in head, in, ahead of you and you're, dis, and you're discouraged or you're tired. And you need endurance. Well, there's, there's two things that I want to encourage you in response The first one is to read these couple of verses, one from Romans, one from James. This week, bring those before you and read those through prayerfully throughout this week. The second thing that I would encourage you to do is let us pray for you. So if you have need of endurance, you're going through something hard, you find yourself tired or distracted or whatever else, you're just going through something hard, I want you to stand up and we're going to pray for you. Suffering is part of following Jesus. Don't miss the opportunity. Some of you, some of you still, you, you have need of endurance. So stand up and let us pray for you. Now what I'd like to do is ask those of you that are seated to also stand and find those people that are standing because they want prayer and put your hand on their shoulder and let's pray together. Father in heaven, God Almighty, thank you that you are present in this moment, that you are at work by your spirit, through your word, and you've been cleansing us. You've been renewing our minds. You've been restoring our souls. You've been leading us to Jesus. And we thank you for that, God. And pray that that work continues. And dear God, we all have need of endurance. We want, we thank you that you have given us such a hope to look forward to. You've given us something so wonderful ahead of us. And I pray, Lord, for you to give us that perspective so that we're not overcome or overwhelmed by what's in front of us. And Lord, we pray particularly for those who are standing saying, I need endurance. Lord, even this very moment, please help us to trust and rely upon Jesus. And in that, Lord, Develop in us that inner fortitude. Give us endurance, Lord. It's a work that only you can work. And I pray for these brothers and sisters, these dear ones, Lord, that you will strengthen them and uphold them and make them strong, firm, and steadfast. Thank you, God. Thank you, God not only for your promises, but for your present work at this moment. And Lord, as we we go from this place today, Lord, help us to look ahead and not just in front. Your name be praised. Amen.